The gameplay of Three Houses lends itself to a lot of customization. Thanks to its class system, you have a lot of different solutions to problems you may encounter. Got some pesky flyers that are overwhelming you? Invest some units into bows. Need more damage? Master the brigand class and get death blow. If you could only tweak and add some convenient perks to your units, this game would probably feel a lot more balanced, but that's not the reality we live in. Because the truth is, Three Houses is one of the most broken games in the series. The devs, intentionally or not, dispensed some truly campaign trivializing and chapter breaking things for the player to use. Of all the truly overpowered mechanics, abilities, and gambits, I'd say there are 10 that truly stand out, at least to me, in sheer ridiculousness, disproportionately good utility, or just simply being really really amazing, but not game breaking amazing. Originally, this video had eight, excluding two entries that I ended up including. The consequences of Three Houses' sandbox unit customizability and wide open chapter layout for the most part are that there's no one true way to play the game. There's no ranking system and no PvP. And so, depending on how any given player wants to complete the game, they will value different things. This made compiling a short list, which ended up being 10, a little longer to do than I thought. Are you a challenge runner like an LTC or want to complete the game as fast as possible? What about about modding your switch for a very niche 0% growth run to see what is truly broken. Do you just want to see the world burn on enemy phase and have everyone die immediately? Or do you like playing safe and non-committal on player phase? Or do you want to run more risky, low HP dependent setups? Or is your goal to get the biggest, stupidest damage numbers ever? All of these different ways to accomplish the same thing in beating the game mean making use of different mechanics and abilities and setups the game can offer you. The goal of this video is to list off 10 that, if you happen to play like what I mentioned above, there is a high likelihood that you abused them to accomplish that goal. It is thanks to combinations of these 10 that allow players to easily one round KO every non-monster boss, low turn clear every chapter, and even win on maddening with no growths whatsoever. Be warned though. At the end of this video, you may never look at three houses the same way ever again. There is a lot of incredibly broken tools in this game, and if there's something I didn't mention, it's because I like rounding things off to 10, and if we listed everything really good in three houses, we'd probably be here forever. I opted not even to order this, because viewer, there are some things in life that are just not worth the trouble. The implications to rank Broken Thing 1 over Broken Thing 2 in a 5 year old sandbox game are dire, and I don't want that smoke. I'm already priming my mind to read comments that start with, I'm I'm surprised you didn't mention, or I would argue that. In fact, the only thing I'm ordering in this video is a nice hearty meal from the sponsor of today's video, Food Devils. Food Devils is a game being developed by Alfred Kamen, a good friend to my channel with deep roots in the Fire Emblem community. Originally starting his game dev career with a Sacred Stones ROM hack into a full-fledged indie game, this new project combines Fire Emblem's grid-based combat system with roguelike mechanics you would see in Darkest Dungeon. In this game you play as the last human chef in a post-apocalyptic world with the goal to attract human adventurers with your food, make them sign contracts with Food Devils, and organize expeditions to collect monstrous ingredients. The gameplay loop combines the best parts of strategic Fire Emblem gameplay into roguelike, procedurally generated elements. You can also freely customize your adventurers, and based on devil contracts, they can change their class, movement types, base skills, and stats. Think of it like a combination of Fire Emblem's branching class system and Seer's snare from Fire Emblem Heroes, all the while growing closer to your new demonic friends, in spite of any ulterior motive they might have. Food Devils has recently broken past 230% of their funding goal on Kickstarter. This makes it guaranteed that the game will land on all consoles, including the Switch and its successor after the PC release in 2025. But the page is still active so you still have time to support Alfred and Food Devils before it's too late. Check out the game's Steam and Kickstarter pages down in the description. And thank you Alfred Kamen and Studio Daimon for sponsoring today's video. Let's start with combat arts and abilities. Raging Storm Edelgard is arguably the best character in the entire game. She may not have as many pure stats as Dimitri, but she has a combination of more optimal boons and banes, can access Pegasus Knight, and access certain abilities quicker than her royal counterparts. And just when you thought maybe Dimitri could outclass Edelgard with some time skip shenanigans, the devs gave her Emir, and Emir gives her Raging Storm, the most game ending skill in all of Three Houses. I say game ending in particular, because if you value just beating a root, nothing comes close to Emir in tandem with Warp and 
and dance strats. At the cost of four weapon uses and being a wyvern rider or wyvern lord, making use of her axe boon and support like the stride gambit, Edelgard gets to cruise from one enemy to another, and in the case of monsters and Rhea herself, attacking the same enemy multiple times. It is true that Emir's 20 uses is a limitation, and the only material that repairs it is agarthium, something only droppable by titanesses and sandworms. The thing is, chapter 16 gives you two full repairs as a reward, effectively giving Raging Storm 10 total uses for only 6 chapters. With the right combination, Crimson Flower is basically over the moment it starts. If your goal isn't cheesing the entire route, then it's still ridiculous, but nothing in the game single-handedly trivializes the journey to complete a route. The only things that hold Raging Storm back is the fact that it's only available for six chapters in one route, as well as that Raging Storm needs support from other completely cheesy and broken stuff on the list. <laughs> Vengeance. Vengeance is learned early by Dudu, Bernadetta, and Cyril, giving it multiple times more availability than Raging Storm, and it is single-handedly the most unfairly broken player phase attack button in the game if your express purpose is to delete any enemy that isn't a monster. Vengeance has an extremely simple formula. Add max HP minus current HP to attack. Unlike what one may expect, the added damage is not scaled down to some random equation. If you have max 30 HP and your current HP is 10, you just get 20 20 true damage. But when you consider stacking HP and skills that boost damage, that 20 extra damage becomes a lot more broken than it already is. Its effectiveness is exemplified in challenge runs because it demonstrates that in a 0% growth run, which in other words means a character will never gain stats via leveling, Cyril, as demonstrated, using Warmaster bases and support bonuses alone can one-hit KO Edelgard at her last remaining bar with gigantic bonus damage and a crit rate so high it would make Rutger blush. Because this even has the hilarious added bonus of plus 10 crit which gives Cyril and Dudu over 100% crit as Warmasters. This even works for a character that can't access Warmaster like Bernadetta. Bernadetta can, using her base stats alone, one-hit KO every single non-boss monster in the whole entire game, with the exception of Dudu in Chapter 17 of Crimson Flower, who has enough bulk to not die immediately. Thanks to the minimum base stats of Paladin, 32 HP and 19 strength, plus Lance Mastery and their class skill Lance Fair, she just clears any human in the game regardless of difficulty. This skill is completely absurd thanks to its 1 to 1 true hit bonus, and no other combat art comes close to giving this much raw damage. What the hell? Some may be averse to Vengeance due to its HP threshold requirement and the need to be at literally 1 HP to make the most of it, but you would be very surprised at how creative you can be to get to 1 HP. Using Guard Adjutant, more on this later, Miracle Gambits, self-inflicted damage like Lava Tiles, or in the case of Cyril and Dudu, Hero's Relics. On top of that, maintaining this HP without dying is actually much easier than you would think because Assassin and Trickster exists. Class any three of these into them, get to 1 HP, have literally anyone else around for stealth to activate, and I'm not kidding you, you will never die. Congratulations, you've now created the Stealth Bomber. No way I can lose here. Hunter's Volley. Hunter's Volley is really strong once it's finally acquired. This art, mastered by the sniper class, turns an otherwise limited class, or a unit lagging behind in killing potency, into a delete button on player phase, giving the brave effect to skip enemy retaliation to attack twice, being extended at range 2 to 3, which means 3 to 4 thanks to bow range plus 1, and giving plus 1 might and 15 hit alongside snipers having bow fare, it makes the user able to deal massive damage reliably. There are many flyers in this game, and maddening provides enemies with speed stats so high that doubling may be completely out of the question. In instances like this, a high accuracy instant double move at 4 range becomes extremely valuable to pick off enemies with ease. It also greatly bolsters the effective range of snipers to begin with. They are footlocked at 5 move, but in spite of this, their threat range is 9 tiles long. Furthermore, that range is really non-committal. Extended long range options in this game are balanced around being unable to double, having low accuracy, and having really low uses. Hunter's Volley has 0 of those obstacles. There is almost never a reason 
not to use Hunter's Volley when you have it, perhaps unless Curved Shot is more appropriate for a situation. The irony is that the real balancing around Hunter's Volley isn't in the art itself, it's in the class. Sniper kind of sucks otherwise. It's a footlocked class that provides a paltry 1 strength and 0 speed. You need Hunter's Volley to double on Maddening. What's more is that as a class mastery skill, you have to commit to grinding 150 or 75 rounds of combat with max statues in a really mediocre class. Sniper is like the est of three houses, and depending on who you ask, that's not a good thing. Once you have it, it immediately provides incredible and reliable killing throughout the entire game from that point. Yes, I've got you. <laughs> Bernie's unstoppable! Battalion Vantage and Battalion Wrath Dimitri is particularly broken because he's the only character in the game that has access to both these battalion skills at the same time. Battalion Vantage is a passive ability that allows the user to always attack first if their battalion's HP is less than a third of their max. Wrath is the same thing but grants 50 critical hit if the foe initiates combat. They're both enemy phase abilities but stacked together Dimitri gets 50 crit and attacks first. And the setup for this is not only super easy by just letting Dimitri take some battalion damage till he hits his threshold, you can also just not heal your battalion between battles, so you get this combination on turn 1. These skills being tied to battalions also means that Dimitri will do this at full HP as well. So give Dimitri this, plus Retribution and Azur Moon is actually completely cooked. He can easily reach 100 hit and 100 crit to just insta-kill almost everything that tries to attack him. The major weakness to this strategy is against monsters, as they have very high HP, multiple bars, and barriers that have damage. Also, gamuts are uncounterable, but besides that, Good luck, enemies. This is yet another combination of skills that are so overtuned that they break the game's difficulty completely. He was quite literally designed to kill every last one of them. I won't be deterred! I swear it wasn't in vain. Stealth. As I've done research for this video, I've come to the conclusion that stealth is, well, stealthily overpowered. Pun intended, I don't care. Coming in as a class skill on both assassins and tricksters, this ability prevents enemies from targeting the user only unless there is no one else for that enemy to target, barring some weird enemy and reinforcement exceptions that come up extremely rarely, but that's not important. The flavor text for this ability is completely wrong, perhaps in a vain attempt to hide the implications of how broken this actually is. This skill, ironically, makes the assassin an extremely useful support unit for rally or gambit botting, with stride and impregnable wall, retribution, or anything else you want. They can follow along other units without any concern of dying at all. As you can see in this example, Ignatz is rallying Cyril while being in range of several units who can easily one round KO him, but will target a max HP and max defense Dimitri instead. Like I mentioned before, this also works incredibly well with Cyril, Dudu, and Bernadetta for vengeance botting. Now they supremely live up to the title of assassin and the enemy is actually not allowed to kill them because they can't see them beyond monster AoE damage. So just if that happens, don't get hit. The implications of stealth as a supportive and offensive option are disgusting. You can have 1-3 to three support bots of any kind sticking to enemy phase or player phase nukes, and as player phase nukes, these three seriously just get to survive on 1 HP so long as you don't mess up your unit positioning. A lot of folks are averse to HP threshold skills because they don't want to risk dying, but stealth and thoughtful positioning does away with that worry completely. It is extremely versatile and very easy easy to acquire for Assassin. Abusing stealth is one of the more creative tactics in the game, and in my opinion, it's really, really funny. Gambits Retribution Retribution is a gambit tied to three separate battalions. It's a support gambit that allows any unit in its six tile radius to counterattack regardless of distance for five turns. An infinite range counterattack with any weapon you want. For five turns, it also has two uses. The funny thing about ranged weapons in past games is that in some of them, they were the best weapon in that game for this very reason. In Blazing Sword through to Radiant Dawn, javelins and especially hand axes are mostly agreed upon to be the most broken weapons in that game due to their cheap and early availability and no actual statistical drawbacks significant enough to be a bad idea compared to their one range iron weapon counterparts. 
Future games would nerf the potency of these weapons, like Fire Emblem Fates making hand axes and javelins pretty situational. Three Houses presents Retribution and says, Hey, remember those early title hand axes? What if that was a killer weapon? Or an effective weapon like a rapier? It's already a unique and powerful gambit by the effect alone, but it's six tile effectiveness being able to be used twice in a map and lasting a ridiculously long five turns is complete overkill. Stack Vantage and Wrath on top of this and you have created a unit that basically gets free kill kills off critical hits while always attacking first. Again, this makes Dimitri incredibly broken. This strategy completely trivializes enemy phase. There is quite literally nothing the enemy can do on their turn anymore unless they use an offensive gambit or siege weapons like Ballistae, Onagers, and Orbs. That is the only thing they have to ignore this combination. Unless you're on... Yep, Blue Lions, where Sacred Shield and Azermoon exclusive battalion brings all ranged attacks to zero damage. All is going to plan. Impregnable Wall. Found on the Kingdom Armored, Empire Armored, and Alliance Wyvern Co., all starting on Chapter 8. This gambit reduces all damage taken and all damage dealt to 1 for 1 turn. With 5 uses in a 1 by 3 tile AoE, this gambit allows everyone ever to tank anything ever. It's extremely useful to hold a certain position on a map, or more creatively, can be used alongside the stealth skill to breach deep into enemy lines without any risk of dying. The only thing that bypasses the damage reduction is Poison Strike. Using this gambit circumvents the usual thought process and strategy in the game. No further thought of risk slash reward, RNG mitigation or survivability is required when you neutralize enemy attacks for one turn. They're skipping enemy phase while the enemies themselves can be baited into moving on them, including bosses, guaranteeing survival against high crit rate enemies, and it can be used after all combat was done at the end of player phase to ensure zero risk of death. Lots of these broken mechanics allow you to skip how Fire Emblem is supposed to be played. Impregnable Walls, skip is skipping risk and only giving you reward. For three characters at a time, five times per map. Stride. Found on the Saros Holy Monks, Kingdom Cavalry, Gautier Knights, and the Secret Transport Force, this weirdly early game gambit, which is also E rank, is gained as early as Chapter 3. This giant AoE support gambit boosts allies' movement by 5 for 1 turn. Look, there really isn't much to say that isn't completely self explanatory. Everyone gets to move significantly farther, and when combined with dancing and warps, it allows you to 1 turn clear defeat boss objectives with ease. Even in cases where you need to reach an area with 1 unit to trigger the chapter end, this does that for free. The freedom of movement, combined with flyer mobility, makes you into water. You can be anywhere you need to, set up linked attacks and gambits, abuse Kanto even harder and hit and run. When stacked with masterclass flyer movement, for example, you get 13 movement unimpeded. The absurdity of this gambit is made more so as this is the earliest available broken option in this list. E rank and you have a high amount of battalions with this gambit. Azur Moon is an easier route because of its unit availability, but this also includes battalions, due to Kingdom Cavalry being route exclusive. Azur Moon can have a rather excessive four stride gambits going on at once. Now let's finish off with two more that don't really fit the above list. Guard Agitant. To catch those up to speed who may have forgotten, Three Houses' iteration of Pair Up from Awakening and Fates comes in the form of Agitants. You can have at max three Agitants, which are units who aren't playable but provide one of three supports to a character they are paired up with for that chapter, depending on the class they are. These are Heal, Follow Up, and the actual broken one, Agitant Guard always reduces damage of enemy follow-up attacks by a fixed percentage based on the pair's support level. If an enemy follow-up attack would KO the host unit, the host unit survives with 1 HP instead, even if they already are at 1 HP. When an enemy triggers consecutive attacks, Agitant Guard will not affect the second attack, but will for the third and fourth. Guard will always negate damage from a follow-up attack. Unlike follow-up, there is 0% chance this won't go off. The support level just determines how much damage is reduced, but that's not the broken part. The broken part is that regardless of support level, as in this even works with not C support, you get guaranteed miracle on follow-up. As long as you survive the first hit, you straight up live. This Agitant type is essential for Vengeance setups because it gives you max damage immediately. This actually just rewards you for getting hit. It is overtuned compared to its other adjutants. Damage reduction is strong because it will always reduce, but Miracle, without any chance of failure, not even being tied to a skill or even luck, is very strong. Why does it even need to have this? You're so You're in my way! That's what you get. Wyvern Rider. 
So Wyvern Rider is a very interesting class. It may surprise you, but Rider is arguably the best advanced class in the game, and even better than several master classes. Flying is broken in three houses, and Rider provides you with it much, much earlier due to its availability thanks to its certification requirements and the class skills needed for damage that Wyvern Lord would give you anyway. Let's start with certifications. Getting B slash C rank in axes and flying respectively is easier and faster to get than A rank in a singular rank that are required for other advanced classes. Take Yuri for example. He's a character with Banes in both of these skills, but thanks to the low requirements, he can reach them faster than he can certify to Sniper, which is A rank in bows, with his boon. A lot of other advanced classes require you to train two weapon ranks at once, which is harder to do than one weapon rank and one movement type rank. You can train flying, cavalry, or armor through chores while power grinding a weapon rank in instruction. And given that axes are very, very valuable in this game, you'll be strengthening that rank in combat already. C flying is easy to obtain in of itself, even if you have a bane in it. This combination just makes it easier than usual to get certified for Wyvern Rider compared to its other advanced classes, even other mounted ones. The stat bonuses on Wyvern Rider are really strong. You get plus 3 strength and speed alongside the class minimums of 18 strength and 14 speed, giving you a net gain of 21 strength and 17 speed. So not only do you get very good offensive bonuses, you can also fly. Riders get Axe Fair, giving the user free damage with the best all-around weapon type in the game. The only real limitation is that flying battalions are kind of limited and all start at D rank and they are in the shortest supply. They otherwise usually have the best stats for a battalion anyway, so it's like, kind of not really a limitation whatsoever. Becoming a Wyvern Rider also opens you up to getting Wyvern Lord, so even though you can do mad work as a Wyvern Rider through level 20 to 30, you're rewarded with an absurd masterclass when it's all said and done. Well, viewer, there you have it. Eight of the most absurdly broken and cheesy things in Three Houses. If you are having a hard time on Three Houses Maddening, then I hope this video has encouraged you to finish that run. Game breaking, combat arts, wildly overtuned gambits, polarizingly strong classes that invalidate most others, and then you have Adjutant Guard, which has no business being that much better than the other two. Perhaps Three Houses should have a sequel so we could see how broken Fodlin could be on the Switch's successor, or just bring battalions back and see what they come up with next. Anyways, major thanks goes to Three Houses Optimizer and speedrunner original raisins for the script help and feedback this video would absolutely not be possible without his help and that will do it for today's video thank you to all of my patrons for supporting the channel and helping to keep the lights on and a special thank you to my 15 dollars great lord patrons who are based gumi atsi verdant pickle manthian Raven King, Zythid, Kevin the Nerd, Nobu, Saxi, Arkholt, M Farmtown, Adelaide, Phex44, Kelby, Kobo Redive, Silverhaired Freak25, Prime Fusion, Skyla, and Fur Muzzle. And everyone, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Deuces.